originally on this floor of the jail, and the reconstruction shows a scene set in the 18th century. Christian Harrison, sentenced to be transported to Botany by Australia for 14 years. He will shortly be taken to the holding prison, an old ship moored in the Thames estuary, where he will await a packet ship which will take him to the other side of the world. He sits thinking about the length of time he will be separated from his family and the terrifying journey that lies ahead to the other side of the world. Edward Freeman, convicted of murder. He stands chained to the wall, waiting to be hanged the next day. James Thompson, sentenced to land for stealing a horse and suffering. A well-known Ely criminal, he has made several desperate attempts to escape, and to prevent him trying again, the jailer has fixed a spiked iron collar to his neck and chained him to bars on the floor. Hey, Christian, Christian, don't just sit there looking at the floor. Can't you get some more light in this wretched place? I can't afford the price of a candle. I'm trying to think of ways to get some money for my wife and children while I'm in Botany Bay. Well, I that miserable old jailer for a bit of candle. You're the only one in plenty chains. You don't want to worry about the kids, Christian. Thomas Parsons charity with Arthur while you're away. I don't suppose I'll ever see them again. Not many come back from Botany Bay. You should worry. At least you'll be alive, which is more than James and me will be this time tomorrow. And all because of the flea-ridden old horse, which I only borrowed in any case. Ted, why ain't you got no proper clothes? When you're up before the judge, you looked right smart. Yes, I was smart too. That's why the girls came after me. When I got here, the clothes were stripped off me back and sold in the market for only shilling and fourpence just to pay the price of a drink the jailer in new garments. Come on, Ted. You know the rules. Pay up or be stripped. I always make sure I have a shilling in my pocket. At least then we get to have a few drinks, even if we do have to pay a high price. Not that I can eat or drink with a spike collar around the neck. That's your own stupid fault, James, for breaking out through the roof every night. And then put those great thick boards on the walls. Anyhow, you know is that you'll get caught, and the holes you might never get mended, and you'll have to stand here in the freezing cold. Oh dear, oh Lord, why are we punished so cruelly? God save you both, and God save me, and me kids. Oliver Cromwell died in the Palace of Whitehall on the 3rd of September 1658 following an illness which had worsened with grief over the recent death of his favourite daughter Betty. In life he had refused the crown and title of king, but in death his people buried him as a monarch in the chapel of the kings in Westminster Abbey. He had achieved much as Lord Protector, had encouraged religious toleration, and had made his country one of the greatest in Europe. However, in 1660, Charles II was restored to the throne. Those who had signed his father's death warrant were in their turn to be executed. Three of those who had already died were also not to escape punishment, and their bodies were exhumed. So it was that Oliver Cromwell's body was removed from Westminster Abbey. After being hanged at Tyburn, the head was cut off, placed on top of a pipe, and displayed above Westminster Hall. But on the night of a great storm, the head fell down. A soldier picked it up, 
later, it passed into many hands. Three centuries later, in 1960, a head, said to be that of Oliver Cromwell, was buried in the anti-chapel of his old Cambridge College, Sydney, Sussex, where it remains to this day. Cromwell's life ended far away from this house in Ely. But some say they have experienced a ghostly presence in this very bedroom. Could it be that the Lord Protector returns to keep a restless watch over his much-loved home?